Today, we're going to do something uh, that's not quite as dominant. And here's, here's what I mean about memes. Taking this text from the Princess Bride. <laughs> you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Actually, you keep using that meme, and I don't think you understand what that meme means. So that's why we're going through these. It's a little unit of cultural transmission from the Old Testament. And here's the ones we're going to look at. Last week, we started with rest. And so today, we're going to look at priests. Oh! And there's a lot of misconceptions about this. So let's take a look. Some of the misconceptions is a priest looks like this. He's the only one who's qualified and has a license to preach out of the Bible. He's the only one that can scare away spirits. And he's the only one that's qualified to take your money. So that's sometimes, that's a, that's a misconception. That's a misconception of priests. But when we think priests in our culture, uh, Catholic priests, they, they use the word priests. So that's what, or maybe this is your idea of what a priest looks like. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. You know, special clothing, carrying candles, the person who's at the center of all the religious activity, the only one qualified to be in charge of what's going on. Eh, that's an idea, too. Maybe this is your idea. Oh, well, back on the nasty side. This is not priests. This is priestesses, I guess. Uh, except that guy's got a beard. Yeah, okay. So I just noticed that, too. So, so that, the, the word priest is used for satanic and new age stuff too. Again, with the idea that a priest is someone who is uniquely qualified to be a spiritual leader and has unique empowerments to do certain things that most of us can't do. Yeah, that's not right. Or maybe this is, your, you know, since we live in Utah, maybe this is your idea of a priest. Yeah, that stern confidence, you know. This is, this is how we, in Utah, at least, this is how we see the priesthood. It looks like this. The priesthood itself in Utah sees itself more like this. Oh, no, 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 really. So if that's the priesthood you're thinking of, it's not that either. So all of these misconceptions about what priests are, is so when you read about priests in the New Testament, you're thinking one of these. None of these are right, according to the Old Testament. So what do we find in the New Testament? Well, I'm going to show you two passages, and, uh, uh, and there's not many. There's maybe three passages. <laughs> there's not that much talked about. Romans 15, near the end of Paul's letter, he says this. Talking about himself, he says, but on some points, I've written you very boldly. And Paul's saying why he was so straightforward. I very boldly, by way of reminder, because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. So when he says that, you see what he's saying? He's saying, listen, in this past book, I might have, you might feel like I've bludgeoned you, like I hit you a lot. You know, I was very bold. He was very bold in Romans, very, very bold in Galatians, really bold in, so what he's saying is I spoke very boldly because I have this ministry that God gave me to the Gentiles. Now that, he could stop right there, but the next phrase is what really tweaks your understanding. A minister of the Gentiles, we get that, we get that. But look what he says, this is another way of saying it in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Priestly service? Well, well, wait a second. You mean like, well, if you look at that word, you read this, you go, what does he mean by priestly service? It, it can't mean like temple, Jewish temple priest things, right? Right? Well, when you look at that Greek word for the priestly service, it indeed is a compound word in the Greek, that means a temple worker. I kid you not. <laughs> it's the two words for temple and ergon, which means worker or job. So he's saying that as a minister of the gospel to the Gentiles, which you know he was called to, he's also a temple worker. What? Now, if that doesn't confuse you a little bit, then you're not thinking of this morning. That should confuse you a lot. Because Paul, I was with Paul when he said just before that, I'm a minister of the gospel of the Gentiles. I get that. But a temple worker and paul never talked about using the temple in any of his books so what the heck see what i'm saying that's a little confusing but he's using jewish lingo when he says this he says in a way i'm doing priestly service of the gospel so that the offering of the gentile well the offering is what happened in the temple so just put this in your hip pocket for a second it seems kind of odd that a minister to the gentiles would use Jewish temple priesthood language to describe what he's doing. Eh? Okay, so that's one curiosity. Let me show you another place. In 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2.9, very famous priesthood section, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You, I mean, the people reading his letter, and that includes us, you are a royal priesthood, uh, which is a phrase that's 
often misused around here. <laughs> but nonetheless, this is really this should kind of tweak you as well. Okay, so I'm a follower of Jesus. How does that make me a royal priesthood? I mean, in the Jewish sense of priests? I mean, what? So, what? All right, that should confuse you some. That should cause you to ask the question, what is this priesthood and why is it royal? But what is this priesthood? I mean, it's, and it's the same thing Paul was talking about before. It's, it's tied to the language of the Jewish temple. Well, that's kind of odd for us because there's no discussion in the early church of using the temple at all, let alone being priests at the temple. So these should raise curiosity. This should, this should clue you in when you're a Bible study person to say, I don't think I know what he's talking about when he's saying priestly. I, I might not have that fully in mind. Is it, it's not Catholic priest. It's not New Age priest. It's not, it, it's not Greek Orthodox priest. It's not, what is this? Okay, so that's how we're going to answer. That's how you know that you're on the edge of a meme that you don't know what it means. So let's take a look and see what it says. Here's priests in the New Testament. If you read through the rest of the New Testament and look for clues about priests, you know what you find? Jesus never confers the office of priest on anyone, and his apostles never do it either. Just want you to know that. <laughs> never confers the office of priest on anyone. Number two, in the historical narrative of the book of Acts, the early church operates without priests. Read the entire book of Acts, find out who the priests were in the early church, and you won't find them, because they're not mentioned anywhere. So again, uh, priests seem to be absent in the life of the early church. Acts is the early church as it's growing after Jesus has died and resurrected, has appearances to take up to heaven, and the church grows through the Holy Spirit. Priests, eh, nowhere. So why does Paul call what he did a priestly service, and why does Peter say that we're all royal priesthoods? when there's no priests anywhere in the New Testament. Ah, see, we're on the cusp of some problems here. And then finally, the concept of special priesthood power is absent throughout the entire New Testament. Now, I, I chose that phrase because that's a very popular phrase around here, priesthood power, in, in the, implying that if you are one of these priests, you have <laughs> special powers <laughs> and things fall. I mean, I'm being a little silly, but I mean that there is a special there's a special enabling that comes if you happen to be a priest. So I want to be a priest because that way I can lay my hands on people and, and heal them and I can lift cars off of people in car wrecks and I want to be a priest because it's got priesthood power. Eh. There's no mention of priesthood power in the New Testament. Silence. So clearly the New Testament isn't going to help us much about the whole priest idea, but we already knew that because really uh, there's only two or three places the word is even mentioned in terms of the body of Christ. It's mentioned in terms of high priests in the narratives of Acts and in the Gospels, but not about the followers of Christ. So let's, let's put ourselves out of the misery and see what we can figure out. It's these kinds of priests. These, this is a, a, a pretty good rendering of what the priests probably look like in the Old Testament. High priest guy in the middle, priest on the left, and a Levite on the right, who is, uh, is not a priest technically, but he helps the priest. We'll talk about that in a minute. Or, or not only Old Testament priests, but this guy as well. Does anyone know who that is? His name is Leonard Cohen. He's the one, he's the songwriter that wrote the Hallelujah song from the Shrek movie. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Know that song? So why do I say he's a priest? It's because of his last name. His last name, Cohen, in Hebrew, means priest. Ah, so this is going to make it a little easier when we go in the Old Testament. Let's look for the word Cohen. I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood in the East Coast. I had lots of friends who were Cohens. <laughs> I didn't know at the time that they actually, with their surname, were meant to be priests in the temple of God. And, uh, it, and, and in fact, to this very day, an interesting scientific tidbit, when they started going through the, the genetics of the Jews and trying to figure out who actually comes from certain tribes of Israel in the past and seeing if they qualify to come to Israel. Do they have true Jewish blood? They would do DNA tests. Well, what they did actually in one particular sense is they, they took all the surname Cohens that were there and they did a DNA test to them and they found out what's common among the Cohens and said, look, if you've got this DNA sequence, you're from the priestly line. And that's how they know who to choose to be priests in the new temple, which they're still hoping to build if you have that genetic chunk. Interesting. 
Cohen. So here we go. We go to the Old Testament, look for a priest, and what we're going to look for is this, is this word, actually in, in the Old Testament, we pronounce it Kohen, but it's Cohen in the surnames today, Kohen. So let's find out what the Kohens were, who my neighbors the Cohens were, and see what they did in the Old Testament. And then maybe, oh, let's hope, maybe that'll tell us how Paul's using it in Romans 15 and how Peter's using it in 1 Peter 2. Okay? That's, that's the excitement. Are we excited? Yes, I am. <laughs> This is, this is basic Bible adventuring 101. This is fun. I want, I want to find out what Paul and Peter are saying. We've got to go back to the Old Testament. So let's go take a look at the Kohen in the Old Testament. I'll use a smattering of verses. Here we go, Exodus 25. We're in the Exodus. We're leaving Egypt, going to Israel. Let them, this is God speaking, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Now this is, this is after they leave Egypt and they're sojourning on to Israel and everyone's living in tents and God says, I want to dwell in their midst. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so shall you make it. So if you go to Exodus 25, about, that's where suddenly they're in the desert, they're on their way from Egypt to Israel, everybody's living in tents, and God proactively says, while you're wandering in all of that sand, I want to live in your midst. See that? I want to dwell in their midst. So what you need to do is build me a tent as well is what God's saying here. You all are living in tents. Build me a tent as well. So when you, when you hit Exodus 25, very explicitly, God tells them exactly what that tent's got to look like and what's got to be inside of it. Chapters 25, 26, 20, go, go check it out because it's very explicit. Even down to the dimensions of this tent that God's going to live in, which by the way, just out of curiosity, the tent that God's going to live in in the desert has the dimensions of 15 by 45. This room is 45 feet wide. Ah, if you take a third of this room, it's the Holy of Holies inside. So this room, but only 15 feet wide. In fact, well, I think that's true. The steel beams in this building are 15 feet apart. So see those beams? Oh, you can't see them. Anyway, so it's actually very small. But it's a tent that God said built. Now, now when, he, when he gave them the instructions for the tent, oh, by the way, let me do a, a kind of a side detour. If you have one of our well, I didn't bring it up here. My ESV study Bible. Well, there it is. <clears throat> well, a lot of us have this because we sold a bunch of these a while ago. If you don't have one, we'll probably do another purchase. But if you've got one of these, it's got the greatest thing here in Exodus 25. Here's a picture of my Bible. There it is. And right here in Exodus 25, it shows you what this specification from God was about uh, how this thing is laid out. And so there's the, there's the 15 by 45 tabernacle tent right inside there and some other stuff we'll talk about in a second and then basically a way to coordinate it off so people couldn't just rush into it um, and a couple pages later it shows you some of the stuff that's inside there's the ark of the covenant and the table of showbread and the and the and the lights that's go in there so if you've got that take a look because it's really fun that's why study bibles are fun because just when you get to gee what's this all about they, they tell you more about it so it's really fun okay so that's where we're going. But after he tells them what it's supposed to be like, then the next problem after we have the tabernacle specified is we need people who are going to run it. And that's the next topic in Exodus 28. God says, Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, he's talking to Moses, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. It's the first time we see Aaron's sons and Aaron himself as priests. So he's basically saying, now that I have a tent to live in and there's stuff inside of it, we need guys to run it and the guys who are going to run it will be Aaron and all of his, his, his folks after him, all his sons after that. That's the priests right there. Aaron's sons do that. In, and what do they do? If you jump to numbers about the same time frame, to do the service for the people of Israel at the tent of meeting, that's another euphemism for the tabernacle where God lives, to do service for the people of Israel at the tent of meeting and to make atonement for the people of Israel. That is to deal with their sin. That there may be no plague among the people of Israel when the people of Israel come near the sanctuary. So, soak this up for a second. What he's saying is, remember he says, I want you to build me a tent because while you wander in your tents, I want to be in your midst. But Aaron and his sons, when they're going to do the stuff they're going to do, it's primarily going to, going to deal with their problem of sin. That's atonement. Deal with their problem of sin. And to keep them from coming inside my sanctuary. Okay. Uh, wait. 
I thought you said you wanted to live in their midst. Now you're saying they can't come into my presence. Well, what do you want? Well, and here we start to get to the conflict that's going on. God does want to live in their midst. He wants to live in our midst. The problem is our sin stiff arms God from being in our nearness. But God still wants to be in our midst. That's why he committed to have his tabernacle tent in their midst. But if those people thought that they could just rush right on into the center of where God lives in that tabernacle, they die because God is just. So here what he's saying is, here, here's the problem. I want to live in your midst, but you've got a problem with sin. I want Aaron's sons and the other Levites that are in that same tribe to deal almost exclusively with that conflict with your sin and my nearness. That's the whole issue. So what did Aaron's sons do almost all the time? sacrificed animals to demonstrate that something has to die on behalf of your sin over and over. And if you read the book of Hebrews and you listen to what the writer of Hebrews says, he says, you know, they, that didn't actually, the animals didn't bring atonement, but they pointed to atonement that was coming from another. They pointed forward to Jesus is what it was. But what took up the time of the priests during the time of Israel? What took up their time was doing everything in the temple that was necessary to atone for the sins of the people because God was near. And he wanted to be near, but their sins would get them killed. That's what's going on there. To the Levites, I've given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting. Now, we talk about Aaron and his sons. Aaron was in the tribe of Levi, but only Aaron's sons and his descendants could actually be people that worked the temple that did the sacrifices on behalf of people. But that left a whole bunch of other people, the rest of the Levites, because the Levites, when they came into the land, remember they came into the promised land? Everyone got land, right? They'd point over there and say, Judah, you've got that land over there. You know, uh, Naphtali, you've got that land over there. And they would actually coordinate it off. They'd draw lines, which is what the euphemism, the lines have fallen good to me. That's the lines of the where you live. Everyone got land except Levites. The tribe of Levi did not. And why? Because God said, I want to dedicate you to the task that I'm about, which is dealing with the sin of the people. But then in the tribe of Levi, only Aaron and his sons worked the temple. What did the rest of the Levites do? By and large, they carried the tent and they protected people from coming in inadvertently into the presence of God. They actually defended the whole area. Uh, we'll see that in just a second. <clears throat> but interestingly enough, because the Levites had this full-time job dealing with the presence of God and the potential harm to the nation of Israel, then, and they didn't have land, so they couldn't grow barley and wheat or animals and stuff. like They didn't have all that kind of stuff. They had no family land. Then when people came and brought their offers and their sacrifices on behalf of their sin and for other reasons, if it wasn't destroyed in the offering, some had to be destroyed, but some didn't. What didn't, was, uh, wasn't destroyed was actually dinner for the Levites. That's how they stayed alive. That's why the tithe back then was such a big deal. Because as the, as the other tribes brought their sacrifices in, there was animals and grain and so much. Then that would be dinner and breakfast and lunch for the Levites at the time. Because they had no land. And God said, I don't want you to be distracted by growing crops. I want you full time to be in my service to deal with the sin of my people. Because I want to be in their midst but they can't be in my midst unless we deal with this. Yeah, TJ, question? Did they have sacrifices for the Levites? And the sons yes, of and there were sacrifices for the Levites on their own behalf as well. So they did sacrifices for themselves, first, in fact, to make them clean in a sense, and then they could do the sacrifices of the others. So that's what the Levites, and Levites did that. The Levites actually also, I didn't mention it fully, but they, they carried the whole apparatus of the tabernacle through the desert. So when they had to get up and move and go someplace else, someone would snap their fingers probably Aaron, and all the Levites would wake up and they'd take down the entire tabernacle and roll up and carry it off and then set up the next place. So that's what they did. Um, okay, so that, so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting lest they bear sin and die. Now, you know, one way to fix this would be if God himself just didn't sit in their midst. They wouldn't, it, they wouldn't, accidentally walk in on God and God would kill them because of their sin. That would be one fix, right? But the issue is, is God wanted to dwell in their midst. He already said that. I want to be in your midst. Here's a God who wants to be in your midst. But the Levites were the ones who were in charge of making sure that no one wandered into the presence of God. There was, there was only one way to deal with this through Aaron and his, and his family, and that was to deal through sacrifice and show that something dies for your sin. The Levites were in charge of keeping people out 
of God's <coughs> presence. Aaron's sons were in charge of somehow figuring out a way for the Israelites and God to coexist in one place because God wanted to be in their midst. See the, see the contrast? It's, re- it's fascinating. Lest they bear sin and die. And then finally, but the Levites shall do the service of the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and they shall bear their iniquity. They shall bear the iniquity of the nation of Israel. How? Through the sacrifices. Through these sacrifices, they would somehow deal with the fact that the people that God wanted to live in the midst of were so hopelessly flawed because of sin that God didn't change his mind about living amongst them. He wanted to live amongst them, but someone had to deal with bearing the iniquity of the people so that God wouldn't kill them because of his nearness. And this has been the story, if you back, back off of this and take the big picture, this has been the story of God with created mankind since the beginning of time. Here's a God who wants to be in the midst of his creation of man, but man is really messed up. And because of man's sin, God can't tolerate their nearness because they're rebellious against him. In a sense, they're sort of stiff arming him all the time and saying, I don't want you. But God says, but I want you. I want to live in your midst. And so this whole, this whole thing with the movement of the Israelites out of Egypt into the promised land is a picture of a God who wants to be with mankind, but mankind does not necessarily want to be with God. And solving the problem of sin is God's initiative. And that's what's pictured with what Aaron and his sons did in the, in the temple. That's what went on. So that's, what's, that's what this is all about. So let me show you how they used to march across the desert. In the lead were three tribes, followed by another three tribes, and then followed by the Levites who carried the tabernacle stuff, the tent of meeting, all that kind of thing. They would come next, and then tailing behind the tabernacle carriers were three tribes again, and then finally in the end was the last three tribes that would come in. And when they would camp, when they would stop for the night, this is exactly how they camped. Exactly how, and this is specified in the Old Testament. Some of you have to camp east of me, some of you west, some south, and some north. And God says, and I am right in the center. God's desire to be in our midst. So that when they would break the next day, they would break, and the, the north, the, the east and the north, the east and the south guys would go first, then the ten of meeting the Levites, and then the other two. Now the Levites, again, they're a tribe. They don't, they don't actually associate with the other 12 tribes that are there. They would set up camp as a circle around where God's tent was, again, to make sure that no one accidentally came into the presence of God and died. The only way you could somehow make your way into the presence of God was to deal with sin. Because sin was the problem that separated you from God. It's a great picture of what this is all about. In one sense, the priestly class were guys who kept you out of the presence of God. In another sense, the priestly class were guys that figured out how to deal with your sin and atone for your sin through sacrifices so that some connection with God can be made. Okay? So that's, that's what we see right here. That's what's happening in the Old Testament. Let me do a, a close-up. We're going to do a close-up of the tent of meeting right now. So here's a close-up of the tent of meeting. There was a cord on the outside, which you saw in that picture, which is basically just a fabric, like an 8 to 10 foot high fabric wall that, that basically kept people out who shouldn't be closer in because they might die. And then there's a tabernacle right in the center. That's the 15 by 45 structure, which could easily fit in this room. In fact, it was also 15 feet tall, and uh, the top of our ceiling is 19 feet. So, I mean, it could, really, it could be just right here. That's how small it was. That's how small it was. There's a tabernacle, and you notice there's an entrance to the tabernacle on the east side. There's an entrance into this court on the east side. Uh, the east is important, and we'll talk about that in a second. And as you, as you came in from the outside world, this is the outside world, when you came in, the first thing you hit was the altar where you burned your sacrifices. The first thing you had to deal with as you, as you shortened the distance between you and God was you had to deal with your sin. Very first thing. And so you'd come there with your sacrifice and the priests, Aaron's sons, all of, they would actually take your sacrifice. They would burn it on the altar as prescribed in, in a lot of places in the Old Testament. They would do everything they need to do. And at that point then, your sins are atoned for, but really pointing forward to the real atonement that happens through Jesus. Something's got to die. So that's, the priests would start right there. They deal with, in fact, during Passover, during Passover, you know, uh, you celebrate Passover, you had to take a perfect lamb have that lamb sacrificed, you take it right to this spot. You take it to this altar. They would roast it for you. 
<laughs> do some prayers, and then you would take it back home to your home and you would eat it entirely in your home. It had to be every single lick of that lamb had to be consumed on Passover. And that's how they would do it. After you got past the altar in this kind of metaphorical approach toward where God lives, God lives basically in the back of the tabernacle here. The next thing you'd come upon as you go that way is this basin that held water. And, uh, and the priests had to wash their hands. You know, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. So again, that was symbolic of cleansing your actions, what you did with your hands. This didn't really provide the soulish cleansing you needed. That only comes through Jesus. But it did picture the fact that before the priests, on behalf of the people, went any further in, they had to have their hands washed. By the way, when the, when the tabernacle is replaced by the temple in Solomon's time, the specification of that big basin, that brazen, uh, it's a, like a, a bronze basin, it's a bronze sea they used to call it, was a bronze, big bronze bowl that was put on the back of 12 oxen. Which you'll see if you have an LDS background. <laughs> That's actually the specification that shows. But there's no baptisms going on here. It's priests washing their hands for going further into the presence of God. That's what that's for. And then as you enter into the tabernacle, which symbolically is where God lives. Because he said, remember, he says, I want to dwell in your midst. I want a tent just like you guys have a tent. This is God's tent. He dwells in their midst. As you go further into that, you'll find first off that this, this big tabernacle is separated into two sections. The holy place is where you first enter on the right. And then past another portable wall into the holy of holies where God lives. Okay. By the way, just dimension-wise, this Holy of Holies, I didn't do it to the dimension really well. It's a perfect 15-foot cube. It's 15 feet wide, 15 feet deep, and 15 feet tall. It's a perfect cube inside. And so you look in there, but, but it, there would not be an opening right here, but there could be an opening <laughs> if you parted that gigantic veil, they call it, but it's not a veil. It's more like uh, 16 tapestries kind of sewn together. I mean, it's a thick, fat, thing it's actually a portable wall is what it is it's a wall it's not just a piece of cloth it's a wall but this was always closed because only one person could go through that the high priest once a year to atone for the sins of the nation of israel so it actually told you the fact that even though you brought in animals outside to the outside brazen altar for the for the things to be burnt that must not be fully efficacious because once a year the highest chief dude of all the priests had to go into the very presence of God and ask God to forgive the people. Yes, yeah, Steve. That's where they would tie the rope around their ankle because they knew that anyone who walked into the presence of God and did it wrongly would be dead. So just in case the high priest you know, wasn't up on all of his stuff and he was secretly sinning and who knows, they knew that as soon as he walked inside there, he would die. And if he died in there... Who's going to go in and get him? Not me. You go get him. No, not me. No, because if I go in, if people started piling to get him out, every one of them would die and make a big pile of dead bodies. It's like someone who touches a live wire and dies, and you don't want to pull them away because you know, you're just going to make a pile of bodies right there. Yeah, right. And they had bells. Exactly. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. So the bells told the people outside, ding 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 he's still alive. Don't pull on the rope. ding 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 he's still okay. <laughs> And even when they're doing stuff inside there, they would move dingy, 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 don't pull the rope, okay, dingy, dingy, because it would be very embarrassing if he was in the middle of what he was supposed to do with God, and someone yanked the rope, and, and then he goes out. It's very embarrassing. So yeah, being in the presence of God was a serious deal, a very serious deal. Once a year, the high priest could go in and do that. Even up through the time of Jesus, the high priest still did that. That's what he did. So there's that portable wall that's closed except once a year. Now, when you went into the holy place, oh, by the way, behind that was the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay, a little bit of a fictional addition to the reality of the fact of the Ark, but it was pretty much the same thing. The Ark itself was, you know, about the size of a, a, a small love scene, actually smaller than that, it was pretty small. But uh, it was made out of wood and it was totally covered with gold. So when you looked at it, it, that's actually a pretty good representation of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Totally covered in gold. On top of it was a removable lid they called the mercy seat. That was covered in gold. And on top of the mercy seat were two angels who were bending in toward the center with their wings kind of folded over the center. This is all according to what God told them to do. Build it this way. And then when you took the mercy seat off and looked inside, you saw three things. Remember what they are? Aaron's rod that budded. 
A bowl of manna that didn't rot. <laughs> and a mouse. <laughs> and Charlton Heston's Ten Commandments. Not Charlton Heston's. Moses' Ten Commandments. Those are inside there. It, it was really a symbol in many respects. We don't have time to look at it. Of God's promises to Israel. And those three things meant different aspects of those promises. Well, that was inside there. Also, it was called the mercy seat, the thing on top, because in a sense, that's where God rested his feet in his throne room. Ah, It very much was pictured after a kingly throne room. So here you've got not only the presence of God in there, but in a sense, a king's throne inside. That's what it's meant to look like. Um, by the way, when they did the full temple of this, of this Holy of Holies inside here, every wall was covered with gold, the ceilings were covered with gold, the floor was covered with gold, and there were two more you know, depictions of these cherubim angels inside there whose wings touched the ceiling. They were 15 feet tall. So as you went in there, pretty impressive. <laughs> Lots of gold. Also very impressive inside there, hold on, also impressive inside there is that when you go into that place, if you could, but you can only be a high priest, if you went into that place, you would see a lot of blood. Why? Because the once a year visits by the high priest, part of what they had to do was sprinkle the path on the floor on the way to the ark with blood and then sprinkle the front of the ark with blood and sprinkle the top of the mercy seat with blood. So here's this beautiful golden room, golden ark, golden everything. Gold, 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 gold. This is awesome. Blood. Which signified, according to the writer of Hebrews, that the actual path to God is paved in blood. Whose blood? Jesus. The imagery is just so powerful. Uh, we don't know exactly when pre-Jesus, but the, the presence of God in the temple, which would, you know, was a cloud that would come down right here in this spot, was gone by the time Jesus comes. But, but what's interesting is that when they bring Jesus there, they say that the glory has returned to the temple. That. Ah, it was equivalent. So anyway, we, oh, this is way too much for us to talk about. Let's just, let me tell you some more about the holy place, okay? The holy place inside there, there was only three things. There was that table with the bread on it, there were 12 loaves there to symbolize the 12 nations, the 12 tribes of Israel. And bread always, in fact, that's one of the memes we're going to look at in a couple of weeks, always represented the necessary minimum you need for life. It is indeed life itself. Bread is always life. So as you came in on your right, you would see a table with freshly baked loaves of bread indicating the frequent, faithful provision of God for life for you and for every single tribe of Israel. Great picture. This is the bread that David ate when he was on the run from Saul, which caused a lot of theological problems <laughs> and which Jesus uses in an argument in the New Testament. Ah, now we're talking Bible adventure, okay? Anyway, so there's bread on that side. On the left side, you would see a lampstand. That's that, that's that, you know, the big wide lampstand we saw right there that would have the oil lamps in it that would burn right there all the time. And the lampstand provided light inside. So as you came in and you looked on your right, there'd be the symbol of, of God's provision of life. And then on your left, you would see light. And in John 1, Jesus is the light that has come into the world. And he's also the bread of life. And then there's one more thing in there, one more thing in there just before the opening from the, uh, that big rug-like thing, <laughs> the veil, is a, ta- is a table of incense. You know, incense, you know, we always connect with Indian culture or something, right? You know, if you grew up in the 60s like me, Incense is where you went to smoke drugs, basically. But I mean, you smell, you smell, yeah, right, Pam? You, know, you smell incense and go, hey, there's some good stuff in here. Yeah, but, but incense back then, had, it had a better meaning than just a place you can find drugs. Incense was, was a symbolic way, and you know, as you burn incense, the smoke comes off and it kind of goes up. It was a picture of our prayers going up to God. And incense has a great smell. So basically, the idea was, here's your prayers going up to God, and when God leans over and sniffs it, he goes, nice. That's all, you, there you are. You're a biblical scholar now. That's the whole idea of incense. So they place, they place the table of the incense by God's directions as close as possible to the presence of God, but still being just outside of his presence. That's why it's right there next to the, in, next to the barrier between there and the ark. So basically, the picture when you came in, you'd, you'd see this, this beautiful smelling smoke going there, and it, it has to make its way through the veil, and God can smell it on the other side. 
I'll tell you, this kind of symbolism just makes me... Again, everything God does is not haphazard. It's, be, it's to teach you something. And if you sit down and you do all this and you think about it for a while, you go, you know, I think I see some more stuff here. But in general, the picture is outside of the outside courts that we showed in the bigger picture is where basically the world and sin is. And inside the Holy of Holies is where God, who is uber just, who cannot tolerate the presence of sin, and from there to there is a pathway that involves, first off, dealing with sin. And that's what the priests spent most of their time doing. But then once the process of sin was dealt with in an effective way, you found life, you found light, and you understood that God heard your prayers. But there's still a barrier. There's still a barrier between you and the actual presence of God. But it's not as though in this holy place he's forgotten you because you find life out there. But there's still one more step into there and it's still, that that veil is still closed. Until you get to the New Testament. And what happens when Jesus is, is crucified? There's an earthquake and that veil right there is torn from top to bottom. Signifying what? the entrance into the presence of God himself has been taken care of by the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, there's not a Jew alive who didn't miss that symbolism. (laughs) I mean, really. But they hustled to kind of stitch it back together because, oops, you know, we we can't let anyone into that. Well, that's what Jesus did. So again, again, it's, it's, it's more than symbolic. This is a way in which God taught the nation of Israel, prefigured what's going to happen in Christ himself, so that when they would see it happen, they'd put, you know, the... The pieces would drop together and they'd go, oh, I get this. That's just like in the temple when, like that, right? Oh, we could spend like weeks on this. This is awfully fun. So here's the situation. We're nearing our wrap up here. God wants to be with us. He wants to be near us. He wants to be in the center of life with you. That's his desire. This is the creator king of the universe. That's his desire with his creation of you, humanity. That's his desire. <coughs> The problem, though, uh, well, and also that God's nearness blesses us. That's God's intention is to bless us with his presence, not to be some kind of oppressive father figure who just kind of reigns in our parade all the time. He wants to bless us with his presence. But God is just, and our sin distances us from God. God wants to be near. Our sin takes us far. And so it's broken in that sense. Our approach to God must deal with sin, that's the first thing you enter as you go in near, near God. And the sacrifice is the means to our approach. There is some sacrifice, which is not a sacrifice of us. It's the sacrifice of another. Another animal had to die. And again, when you put that into the New Testament, you realize it's been teaching me all along that I can't pay for my own sins. Someone else has to. Someone else has to. Sacrifice is the means to our approach. And the priests simply mediate the sacrifice on our behalf. That's what a priest is. That's someone, who, and I'll, I'll make it more clear in a second here. So here's a priest. He's someone who is dedicated to bring others to God through the means of a sacrifice that can atone for sin. That's a priest. And not all the other pictures we saw at the beginning. This is someone who's involved as a third party on your behalf to facilitate your closing the distance between you and God, but doing it through the means of sacrifice because of your sin. That's that's all a priest was in the Old Testament. That's all they did. They had no special powers. That's all they did, was they dealt with the problem of sin for the purposes of bringing us near to God. That's exciting. That's exciting. So when you go back to Romans 15, and he says that this ministry that he has to the Gentiles is in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable. Well, what's the offering of the Gentiles? What's all of our offering? Jesus. So that when the, G- so that when the Gentiles come to God claiming the offering of Christ, God will say, you've got it right. That's exactly right. The Jews understood that all along in a sense, but the Gentiles finally caught it as well so that they understood that when they came to God, God would say, how can you possibly be here without me killing you? And they'd say, well, the offering from Jesus. That's what Paul was in the business of doing as a minister of the Gentiles, was letting them know 
that God loves them and wants to live in their midst, but you've got a problem with sin, but let me tell you about the sacrifice that takes care of that problem. That sacrifice is Jesus. So when Paul talks about his ministry to the Gentiles, it's not just teaching them, it's telling them that something extraordinary has been done on their behalf. There has been a priestly, a priestly offering on your behalf. And Paul says, I'm the priest who basically mediates getting you near God by talking about the sacrifice. That's, that's perfect Old Testament priestliness. So that's why he uses that, that particular thing. And then we go back to 1 Peter 2.9. And he says, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now he's, he's not necessarily talking to Jews here. He's talking to people who are Gentiles. Gentiles, a royal priesthood? That's an abomination. I mean, they're not even from the sons of Aaron. No, because when you get to the New Testament with the sacrifice of Jesus, a priest is someone who says, God loves you and wants to be near you. You have a problem of sin, but a sacrifice has been made on your behalf to pay for what you've done. You can't do it yourself. Now you can be near God. And, that, and, and he says, that's all of you. That's your job now. We are a royal priesthood. We are people that have been called to do simply that, to simply say, God loves you and wants to be in the middle of your entire life. Your sin distances him from you because he's a just God. But let me tell you the good news. A sacrifice has been made on your behalf and now sin is not an issue. That's what a priest does and that's what we do. That's why we're, why are we a, that's a priesthood, but why are we a royal priesthood? Because he's the king. The king of kings and lord of lords has said to us, once you follow me, I could yank you off this planet, but I want you to stay here so that you'll go around and be a priest to those who don't know that God loves them and wants to be in their midst. Their sin is a problem. A sacrifice has been made. Will you be my royal priest to, to mediate that to those who don't know? That makes you a priest. Just, just right there. That makes you a priest. And he says, he says, now we actually become a holy nation. And it goes on. We're a people for his own possession. God's own possession. We belong to him that you may proclaim, there it is, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. If that's what you're about, you're a royal priest. We don't need to bring you any white garments or any black ties or any name badges. We all in the same level have the same delightful job of being priests, mediating the path for those who want to come to God by bringing the offering of Christ. That makes you a priest. No special powers, no special clothes, no special nothing. That's the routine job for all of us. So I'm a priest. Yes, indeedy, you are a priest. <laughs> You're leading others into the blessing of God's nearness through the sacrifice of Jesus. That's all a priest is, and that's what you are. So anytime when Peter or Paul mention the fact that they're in the business of being priests, it's not about burning animals at the altar. It's about walking alongside those who desire nearness to God and making it effective through the sacrifice of Jesus. So now we're all priests in that particular sense. One more PS before we finish. Is the song next to you? I can't remember. Well, next week we're doing Firstborn, which is really going to be cool. Uh. But before we get there, let me tell you something. Over the, over the, the centuries of Christianity, something kind of perverted has happened with this priest idea. And the, the thing that's perverted is the fact that somehow we've gotten to believe that a priest is someone who has a special power in dispensation in the church to do something that the regular members cannot do. You gotta wipe that one clean. That is so non-biblical, I can't tell you. And then in this, in this modern, later modern era, we've taken that idea of the specially sanctioned powerful priests and we've turned it into the pastors of churches. And we've kind of perverted the pastoral role into the, the specially sanctioned guy with power who's the only one who's equipped to be able to teach out of the Bible and to scare away spirits and to collect money. And that's totally wrong. In, in the body of Christ, as Paul talks about it in several places, Jesus is the head, and then there's us. There are no special priests. So I would just recommend to you as you go on in life, if you get into church context where it looks like they've taken the guy in front and turned him into a special priest, you really don't want to be there. 
It's very man-centric in that particular sense. Because we are all priests, which means that we are all qualified to bring up the word to people. We're all qualified to pray for God's spirit to do things in people's lives. We're all qualified to give for the purposes of walking people into God's presence through the sacrifice of Christ. So that's why here, and this is a little aside behind here, some of you know that I get a little rankled when people call me Pastor Jim. And I go, no, let's just, just do Jim. What do you say? And it's because of this. There are no specially empowered people in the body of Christ. I have a particular job and you do too, but we both equally, equally are priests to our God by ushering people into his presence and mentioning the effectiveness of Christ's sacrifice on their behalf. Even the priests during Israel's time, they were, they were in service. They had no special powers or any special anything, really. They were in service of the people because if they were not in service on behalf of the people, God would destroy Israel when he lived in their midst because he's a just God. So yeah, it's in service and Jesus says, I'm here to serve and not to be served. He's the great high priest. I mean, in, in all these things. And so then for us, Priesthood has nothing to do with special powers or appointments or privileges. It's about serving. In fact, in the very end, when you look at the Levites, that's why God did not give the Levites land. He said, you guys are doing this full time. And by the way, you're not going to get anything out of this in terms of land to get rich off of because you'll pass on to your children what? Land? No. You'll pass on to them the job of serving. In a sense, the Levites were the lowest in Israel because they never had any land. The rich and privileged had land. The Levites had zero. And that's what you as a priest have. But you have the delight of serving, to usher people in and talk about the effectiveness of Christ's sacrifice on your behalf. And now you can have life with God. You know, many times we talk about being saved and we talk about being saved from the wrath of God because of our sins. But we always leave out the best part, which is we're saved to life with God. That's why the sins had to be dealt with. And that's why you can come into his presence that way. And so Jesus died the veil in the temple was rent aside from top to bottom, completely exposing and welcoming in the presence of anyone who would have their sins taken care of through the sacrifice of Christ. Now, as a, as a prelude, if you haven't read the book of Hebrews, you're all set to read the book of Hebrews <laughs> because the writer of Hebrews takes everything we just glossed over this morning and puts it in the context of Christ. And he even says that going into that inner section where the, where the high priest could only go, he says that Jesus is our forerunner to go ahead of us into that very place. And we follow in his footsteps. And even still, that path is paved with blood, the blood of Christ. So you're ready for Hebrews. You're set to go. Next week, firstborn. And we'll see what that's all about. Because it doesn't just mean the ones who were born first. Yeah, you knew that, didn't you? Okay. Let's pray. And I think we're going to sing Holy of Holies. Yeah, take me in. So, Father in heaven, we thank you that indeed you have gone to such lengths to give us the understanding as well as to accomplish for us the sacrifice for our own rebellious sins with the purpose, with the purpose of, of blessing us with your presence and delighting and enjoying you. It's a remarkable message. It's written so clear and so loud in the Old Testament. And so, Lord, I, I, can see, I can see why Peter and why Paul would mention it almost just in passing. Everyone knew that's what a priest does. He ushers people into the presence of God through the effectiveness of the sacrifice of Christ. So, Lord, I pray that as we go away from here, you'd give us creative understanding through your spirit about what exactly that means, where you've put us. We know where you've put us is deliberate and that the exposure that you've given to us is deliberate to other people around. And pray that we might... Uh, in our minds at least, put that mantle on and remind ourselves, oh, we're a priest here. I got to talk about this. I got to talk about the blessing of being in the presence of God. I got to talk about the solution to evil and to sin in our lives so that they'll be blessed by your presence as well. Lord, we're, we're delighted. We don't know why you would entrust such an important thing to idiots like us. We're faulty. But through your spirit, you lead us and guide us and give us the words. And in the process, miraculous things happen as you draw many to yourself. So thank you for involving us in this great work and we thank you for drawing us into the Holy of Holies through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus himself. So thanks in Jesus' name, amen.